Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, let's keep the party going uh, here at the interrogation booth. Um, oh dear. Why don't you grab a seat maybe on that side of the table? That'll look, uh, you'll both look very handsome in profile. Mm -hmm. Uh, anybody need any water? Are you good? I would love some water, please. Well, this water has been drunk, but it's okay. I'll get Thank some more water for you. Have you all seen this panel here, by the way? What is it? It's the old stock market. Uh, yeah. yeah, you clicky clicky. Uh, old no. stock market clicky clicky. Yeah, it's the stock market clicky clicky. That's the official <laughs> name for it. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, we have some questions from the audience, but we could have more questions from the audience because we do have uh, quite a bit of time here. Um, we, of course, don't need to fill it all, so only as much as you care. Um, I am so excited about edge computing personally. You know, I've been, you know, like in my yesterday's talk, you know, I said we built this real time system on it. It's been so powerful. Um, but it seems that there's a lot of Cloudflare <laughs> going on. Um, so one of the big questions here that I think we need to start with is, is okay, if I don't want to use Cloudflare, what else can I use? Is this like a Cloudflare is only game in town kind of thing or? In fact, not. In fact, I recommend going and trying a sample app with all of them. They all have their own kinds of uh, trade-offs. So Fastly comes to mind. Fly is making a move. Amazon has its own thing. Uh, Railway, it isn't really edge compute, but they're building out their data centers. Uh, and each one of them have their own trade-offs and teams and philosophy. So for example, fly.io lets you run any language, not just JavaScript. Uh, Fastly has a different kind of network. They are also very VASM friendly. Amazon is a six bajillion dollar company. Don't give them your money. Um, give it to Cloudflare. Uh, I, I highly recommend testing out all these systems. It's so much fun. Uh, it, to be able to not argue about use effect and actually see these things running in little things across the planet, just an absolutely wonderful time. Yes. And uh, did we mention Deno yet? Deno Deploy? Deno is also pretty good. That's yeah. right. Deno Deploy is also, uh, uh, and it has an incredibly cute mascot, which counts when you're using technology, I think. And Samuel, would you like to give any shout out to any competitors? Yeah, uh, I mean, obviously I'm biased, but Cloudflare is not the only game in town. There's Fastly, there's Lambda at Edge. Lambda isn't really uh, Edge, but Lambda at Edge is Edge. There's Bun coming out soon. There's Lagan is another one. Uh, Deno Deploy. Uh, there's Superbase, which I think uses Deno. There's Netlify, which also uses Deno. Uh, Vercel, obviously. A lot of options. Um, Cloudflare is good, but there are other options. Yeah, I mean, obviously each of these have trade-offs. Uh, personally, I just use Cloudflare because they have the most points of presence. Not that mm -hmm. I build, you know, necessarily applications that need to be used absolutely everywhere, but why not? Um, and, you know, one of the, the questions that we keep getting on the last session and, and this session as well is just about, like, the, the cost side of it. And we touched on it on the QA last time as well. But Cloudflare is so incredibly cheap. How do they manage to be so cheap? Um, Cloudflare has a huge network that's built up for its CDN business. And that has a lot of spare compute because we've got all these servers all around the world that are kind of serving, you know, very simple static content. Um, and there's spare compute on those servers so we can run your code at kind of not very much cost to, to Cloudflare. Um, and so the pricing of Cloudflare workers is really, really very cheap. I think the free tier is 100,000 requests a day um, for free entirely. And I think the paid tier is like 10 million requests a day for $5 a month, something like that. Um, there's docs pages that have the exact numbers. Um, yeah, yeah I, I really like really don't want to sound like we're advertising Cloudflare, but yeah, just, again, just this is not sponsored. No, no, but Cloudflare. just for the record, so you know, we built this this verb thing, and you know, we had you know on peak days we have tens of thousands of users daily, real time communicating, and we never uh, went over the five dollar a month uh, limit. So you know, it's one thing. Um, so Neil, what about the pricing for Party Kit? I should have some. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right so now, it's more. So uh, uh, I'm actually on the Cloudflare for Startups program which means I have a bit of leeway. I'm actually not really playing Cloudflare for a while. Uh, so have fun before that happens, before the <laughs> pricing page lands. But that being said, I've done the math, and I believe PartyKit and other, pl because we are going to be a usage-based pricing company, I think not only will we be uh, cheaper overall than everyone else, but even on a unit basis, I think we will end up being cheaper than any other real-time provider. Which is to say, in the spirit of Cloudflare being cheap, and this isn't what investors want to hear. I'm saying like, yeah, I'll, more importantly, uh, the story for the internet for me is that it gave me social and technological mobility from being a kid in small town India to coming all the way here. And if the solutions that I build cannot enable the next 18-year-old shithead sitting in the corner of the world somewhere for extremely cheap, uh, then I would have failed. So the party kit, I think, is going to be like fairly cheap. Uh, but feel free to steal the idea and charge more. There's a business to be made in it. 
Yes, uh, encouraging competition by just just telling people to uh, be more expensive. That usually works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We figured. All right, great. Um, so we have a, quite a few questions about the durable objects, you know, platform overall. And this is, you know, this is really exciting. Um, but I do have to say, like for me, you know, when I first started using them, it took me a quite a long while to wrap my head around like exactly how it works. So, you know, just to, to get a, a grasp, so like you can, you know, you have a worker that is just stateless code that runs, you know, somewhere, but then you can just say, oh, this worker is, is durable, so you can have in-memory state, but then you can also have persistent state, like you can store it, you know, locally on that machine. And then you can also guarantee that any connection that connects to that durable object um, will always connect to that same thing, so they share the same memory, right? That's right. Right, okay, so we're, we're there. So there are some questions here about, um, you know, what else can durable objects be used for? This was a Samuel, but I think we can make it a panel question. Yeah, I mean, pretty much anything. It's kind of a single coordination point. You know, it can build, use to build a platform like um, Particate, and um, we can use any, build any chat application, anything that needs that kind of single coordination point between multiple players. Um, um, if you want to look into older inspirations for the kind, Real-time multiplayer is one of the big ones because of the coordination one. Uh, but if you're in the mood to dive into a little computer science, you want to look into what the actor model was. Uh, in 1973, roughly, they came out with the theory and have been chasing that high ever since. And I think durable objects are the world's first infrastructure level implementation of the primitive. So if you want to know like what you can build with it, there's like 60 years of, oh, we can build highly concurrent trading systems, uh, chat systems, coordination, like. Uh, applications for multiplayer, etc. I think really it's a, you could probably deploy your Remix or Next.js app onto it as well, but really the question is what, is, what are your dreams and ambitions for the next age of applications that you would build on top of this? Um, how, can a, how long can a durable object live? Uh, it lives as, uh, I think it does 30 seconds of complete CPU, uh, which is to say not including like dead time where it's just waiting for I.O. Uh, but it also has persistence where it can like hibernate web sockets, etc. If you write your code in a uh, reliable way, which is why you should use the libraries from PartyKit, uh, it's effectively infinite because what you can do is the moment it's shutting down, you can save some state and then it spins up again and you can like repopulate that state. So if you, you can effectively write code where you, it feels like it lives forever. Uh, so uh, that being said, Bro, like, even I need to, like, figure out what the limits of the system are. Like, it's, it's kind of sci-fi. We're only learning, like, new features, uh, the new characteristics about it on a daily basis. I think you get, like, 30 seconds per request that comes in. So if you want to keep pinging it with requests, um, something like the Lambda model of keeping, um, you know, something pinging your, your function every so often should keep it alive. Um, but you can store stuff persistently on disk and then load it when it spins up again. The idea is that it's able to kind of go to sleep and spin up and go to sleep and spin up and your application shouldn't you know, have any detrimental effects. Nice. Um, so this is um, a question that is kind of, you know, maybe related to Pekka's talk earlier where he was talking about, you know, database replication and, you know, like I in the context of you want your data to live close to your user. Um, so let's say that, you know, you have authentication system built in like in your demo, Samuel, and let's say this user takes a flight then from Los Angeles to Tokyo uh, and then logs on again. Uh, what happens then? they're going to currently have a very bad time. Um, they're going to have the durable object created where they set up their application, and it's not going to be migrated. Soonish, we will be migrating them, like Cloudflare will be migrating them based on kind of current usage patterns, um, so where the user is currently requesting it. But as of right now, they're not going to have a great time. OK, is there any uh, timeline on that? Like, is that something? Yeah, is there any timeline? I need <laughs> it. Like, is there any timeline on that? Uh, I can honestly say I have absolutely no idea, but soon. It's extremely sci-fi, the idea that you can take an object that's running in one part of the world, it goes to sleep and wakes up in LA. <laughs> like, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to them shipping yeah. it. It'll be extremely cool. We're sticking them in hard drives, shipping them planes, and then, yeah. Effectively, yeah. Yeah, um, Samuel, there's uh, another Cloudflare sort of, um, you know, edge persistence protocol D1, which was mentioned, you know, yep. the, the SQLite kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so could you talk a little bit about, you know, way, would you use that for auth or any kind of use case? What kind of use case would you use it for when, when it's sort of like generally available? And also maybe talk a little bit about like what the difference is between the mental model of a durable object and a, and a, and a D1 database. Sure, yeah, um, so D1 is currently in alpha, so it's definitely not production ready. Um, which is why I use durable objects here. Um, but D1 is kind of SQLite on the edge, um, and it spins up an SQLite database and kind of replicates that data around the world. Um, kind of like uh, the thing Pekka was talking about with, with SQLite on the edge. 
Um, I think if it was production ready, yes, that would be a great solution for this. Um, it's currently in alpha, it'll be in beta at some point, and then GA at some point. Um, again, I don't have timelines specifically on that. Um, but yeah, once it is ready, that would definitely be another good alternative. No comment from Sunil. Uh, this is surprising. Uh, Ship it, man. I wanna, I, I, I'll <laughs> basically put a little layer on it and say, hey, PartyKit has databases now. I mean, we, we already do the thing where you can connect to databases because of uh, the recent announcements of Sockets, which is yeah. great. You can connect to Postgres databases and MySQL soon. So that's great. But it sure would be nice if we had a magical SQLite database for every party. I mean, I will say D1 has, has a lot of changes during alpha, so it's a great thing to try out. It's pretty stable. Um, I think they're just holding off and putting it to beta and GA until it's very, very stable. Nice. Um, and I understand that you know there's been a lot of um, sort of rewriting of the D1 like storage engine. Like it used to be sort of like faked, and now it's an actual C <laughs> SQLite database. Um, is there you know like SQLite has its own replication story, right? Like you know SQLite has all of these you know like uh, existing extensions, plugins, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Like, are those going to be now available for D1 or? Um, in terms of like existing replication plugins? Well, but just generally speaking, if you look at the SQLite ecosystem, you know, like not only do you have, you know, the, the SQLite extensions, but also there's lo a lot of tools like Lightstream, whatever, that can take arbitrary SQLite databases mm -hmm. and then synchronize them. So like, let's say that we wouldn't want to, for example, wait Cloudflare to implement this. We would want to use a third party service like, um, you know, uh, Lightstream, for example, to do this. Like, is, is this going to be, is it, do we get full database access to D1 now? Um, I think if you wanted to use something like Lightstream, you probably could, um, but you'd probably have better time with something like Fly.io where you have a better um, access to the kind of underlying metal of the machine. Um, the whole kind of point of D1 really is that the underlying replication system is built by Cloudflare and kind of, you know, as close to the metal as possible. Um, so if you, want, if you want that kind of deeper control, I think probably something like Fly.io and Lightstream, which I think is owned by Fly.io potentially. That's right, yeah, that's yeah, right. Um, would be a better choice. Nice. Um, all right, I think that was my D1 questions. Let's go back to durable objects for a second. There's a couple of new questions here. Um, we'll need to read the tea leaves a little bit with this question. I'm not really sure what the wording here is. Uh, who owns the durable object when deploying? There's a clarification. What's the deploy story when using it along with a Cloudflare Pages deployed app? I don't know if you can use durable objects with Cloudflare Pages. Potentially, some, Pete, do you know? Excellent, okay, so pages and workers are currently different systems. They're being converged over the next kind of wee while, um, and so that answer will be clearer in the coming months. All right, and I don't as of right now, I have no idea. Yeah, I don't think, we, I just realized, I don't think we've defined what Cloudflare Pages is. So it's kind of like a Netlify style sort of deployment platform, right, yeah. for you can have functions, you can have static assets, yeah. all of that. And it's free, it's like free, free. <laughs> Y'all should start making more money. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think we, I, I just have this really like awareness of how much we're just talking about Cloudflare. Um, can I just say that, that Denos, the KV, um, you know, API that they have now for their persistence is actually excellent. So if you are looking for alternative ways of like looking at how do you want to do uh, distributed data on, on edge, uh, Denos KV is actually a really, really good API. I actually love KV because uh, it allows you to do transactions on top of KV operations, which Cloudflare doesn't do. And it's built on something called Foundation DB, which is one of the very few things that Apple has open sourced. It's basically Apple tech that uh, Deno took and has deployed. And it's marvelous. Like, you, uh, I think they will also end up having a real-time story on top of that, like where you, le where you can do live queries on top of databases that you build on top of this. It's fascinating tech. Uh, highly recommend that you play with it. Yeah, Tenno KV is really, really, really cool and much, much better than the Cloudflare KV <laughs> solution. Fine, okay, <laughs> that's the anti-Cloudflare part. Like, you're not that biased. All right, um, now let's go into, um, you know, this, this is maybe like clarifying a little bit the mental models between like workers and, and durable objects. Um, so the question here um, is if people from different places in the world join the same room and end up in the same V8 isolate, doesn't that contradict the reason for using the edge sort of in the workplace, right, uh, in the first place? Like if I'm in, in Finland and, and you're in India and you know, like I join the room first then it's gonna be really slow for you, something from America, Erica joins, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Like why would I even use edge? Why wouldn't I just use a uh, standard web server for this? Such a good question. And the answer is trade-offs, which is if you are otherwise using other edge computing servers, then you take on the uh, complexity of building uh, a system that 
uh, synchronizes over multiple points. You end up with the distributed systems thing. Now you can use YJS, et cetera, for it, and a lot of people basically do. They set up little node clusters and say, hey, let's put a few machines in Australia, in New York, in SF, in London, whatever. Uh, but use, uh, what you gain in reliability uh, and potentially per user like res request response to a thing, uh, you'll actually lose in latency because it's a hard thing to make sure all of them are synced together. Uh, and, you have to, and you have to use CRDT tech, uh, which is not built for a distributed systems thing where you, you, have, you, you can't be certain about message ordering. Uh, uh, when it's going to come, it could be in bad situations. So it's a question of trade-offs. Would you like a simpler programming model, which actually works pretty well because it turns out the latency from something like SF to um, London is roughly about 200 milliseconds right now which is great, by the way, for context for what these numbers mean. An eye blink is roughly 100 to 200 milliseconds. Uh, so when you have, let's say a lot of people are in the same uh, time zone. For example, if inside the city, if you, a lot of people got into the drawing thing, your latency would have been between five to 15 milliseconds. So there's the option for you to load and synchronize an entire website in under an eye blink if you like write it right. So that is the trade-off where you say, okay, fine. Because they are real-time systems, we don't expect people to be uh, working on it uh, 12, uh, across 12 hour time spans. Really, it's about three, six, three to six hour time, uh, time zones. Uh, and it's a question of trade offs. So, do you, would you prefer an easier programming model? And Cloudflare will be introducing sharding and actually automatic durable objects, which you can then synchronize, yada, yada. There, the system will only get better. Uh, the truth is that the first option is available for you right now. Anybody can do it, but that's what they've struggled with for the last 15 years. So the question is whether this new system is actually better. And the gut feel is, yes, it's actually, uh, if you take together the trade-offs and the performance, it's a better option right now. And also, if you, if you have a user coming in Australia and an SF and they're trying to talk to each other over real-time con real connection, you have that inherent you know, network latency limit that just can't be overcome. Um, so there's, there's no system you can design that's going to get over that actual you know, lag. Yeah, I think this is um, you know interesting. Like one thing that all of the uh, the, the four talks that we've had at edge computing have you know sort of focused on or given examples of is how many milliseconds is it from place X to place Y. And now you know there are kinds of software like real time software where milliseconds really do matter. But then there's kind of software where you know like shaving off you know that 20 milliseconds might not be the highest priority for for people. So what else you know like when we talk about like trade offs and benefits using you know, edge compute platform like, for example, Deno or, or, or something like that, uh, <coughs> Cloudflare, um, then what, 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 is there any other reason to use them? Like, if you don't care about milliseconds, should you just stay in Lambda or wherever you're deploying your serverless code now? The rubric that I've been using is, what is it that matters to you? Usually it's a nine to five job. What is the system that helps you build features quickly that are stable and lets you go home uh, once the day is over. It turns out that, that, or it's a, hey, I have a weekend and I get like four hours of programming that I can do for a side project. What is it that can get me like quickly, what are things that I'm familiar with instead of having to learn all these new technologies? Uh, the reason to try out all these different uh, providers is because they all have different trade-offs uh, and you will find something that you just, you know what, just like, like that you, that you just personally like using and maybe that's the one to use. But I, I, I try framing it in that way, like, hey, is it something for your nine to five job? How do you have to learn a lot of new tech to like use it or is it something already familiar? That's why I like JavaScript systems. I bought one Rust book and I, so I'm not writing Rust. Mm -hmm. uh, so anytime somebody says Wasm, I'm like, yeah, okay, we support it, but it's your, like you figure it out, man. Like, uh, uh, but folks who use Fastly are a lot of Rust nerds use Fastly, and they are, they are a great community for that. So if you're actually into the Rust ecosystem, maybe that's better, a better option, simply because the libraries and the support is there. So I think you want to frame it in that way, not so much in terms of milliseconds that you're shaving off, but what is it that lets you live your life? Oh, I'm so deep. Like, it's, <laughs> it's good. And there's also a question of, you know, what do those shaved milliseconds give you? And it gives you more time in your application code to not care about milliseconds. Um, and if you want to just kind of build an application, you know, quickly, um, you can not care about network latency, um, which does help. And also, uh, sorry, just the, on, on Lambda specifically, the, it, there's kind of a question of like, Lambda cold starts can co often be multi-second. So it's a uh, comparison between multi-second and millisecond. And, you know, maybe you want to find a middle ground, but. Yeah, I, um, 
I wanted to kind of make a comment on this as well, which is that you know, the generally with these platforms, I only really have experience with cloud platforms workers and deno, but is that because they tend to be more uh, modern tool chains, right? Like, you know, these are the products that don't have necessarily the legacy of, of, you know, the same deployment platforms like AWS, for example, you know, everything needs to go through cloud formation if you want to actually like deploy it from, from a, you know, sort of code, um, sort of management point of view. And those systems just suck. Whereas, you know, like with Cloudflare, you know, deployments are instant. You know, it takes, you know, a few seconds. We just see the sort of deploy of your That I think platform. was the slowest deploy I've ever done. It's yes. usually faster. Yes, exactly. And, and, and so just the developer experience of being able to develop something locally, run it on your own machine, and then just say deploy or maybe do as a commit hook, uh, and then it's just there. Um, and it's just there globally, everywhere. And, and, and you know, that itself, has gotten for me to the point, sorry, this is becoming a monologue now, um, where I'm actually just using workers and also just party kit for things that they're not really supposed to be used for at all. When I want to just write a little bit of code, deploy it somewhere, I just put it in workers because it's the easiest way for me to get code online. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I don't care about edge, I don't care about any of that, I just, it's the easiest way for me to deploy code for free, essentially, on the internet. Um, and so this is, I think, one of the big benefits is like if you don't care about milliseconds or distributed or, or anything like that, it's just, they're just really easy and nice to use. Um, anyway, um, there was something, Samuel, that you said about, um, you know, there's the cold start times in, in Lambda, you know, like, yeah. you know, one second, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we've heard this term V8 isolates uh, quite a few times today, but I don't think anybody's actually defined, you know, what, what those are. So could we talk a little bit about like how basically all of these JavaScript based um, edge platforms work? How do they manage to be so fast? Like what's the technology behind there? Yeah, um, so V8 isolates are a thing that V8 uses. Um, maybe we should define V8. V8 is a JavaScript engine that Chrome uses. Um, it's built by Google and it kind of runs JavaScript very fast. It's, you know, it's had years of development effort. Um, V8 isolates are a thing that were developed to kind of isolate JavaScript across tabs in Chrome. Chrome now uses processes to do this, but it's just an extra layer. Isolates are really about running JavaScript um, in a context where it can't access JavaScript in other contexts, which is exactly what you want for a multi-tenant you know, server architecture. Um, and so what Cloudflare does is we run kind of one instance of V8 on each of our machines, and then multiple isolates within that um, to run customer JavaScript code, which is a much more kind of lightweight sandboxing mechanism than processes, than containers, than virtual machines. Um, and there's other layers of, you know, defense in depth there as well. Um, but really, it's about kind of a much more lightweight sandboxing measure. Um, to be clear, Cloudflare can run thousands of these on a given machine, yeah. and they start up with effectively zero startup time, which is why workers don't really have the cold start problem that something like a node or Lambda, et cetera, would give you. That's, uh, so V8 isolates are also used by Dino now. I think Dino is also powered by the same thing. Uh, Bun uses JSC, which is the JavaScript engine from WebKit. Uh, and I think uh, if you run JavaScript on Fastly, it's run using SpiderMonkey, which is the JavaScript engine from Firefox. I uh, think it's using SpiderMonkey compiled to Wasm. Exactly, it's SpiderMonkey yeah, compiled cool. to Wasm. It's a, a big inception layer, and it works well. Yeah, yeah that's what I hear. Um, something with the cold starts as well. The way we get such fast cold starts in Cloudflare workers is, there's, I mean, there's obviously some cold start with uh, loading your scripts in the first place, but we race it against the TLS handshake, because when the request comes into Cloudflare, um, you have to do kind of a TLS negotiation before the user can see anything. And so when the request comes into Cloudflare, we start loading the script and also do the TLS handshake, and usually that finishes after the script is loaded. So there's zero cold start once the TLS handshake is completed. Uh, I highly recommend checking out the Cloudflare blog. They yeah. use is an engineering blog, and it has years and years and hundreds of these deep dives into the tech. Highly recommended. It. It's uh, it's a big time suck. It'll take days for you to go through it all. Mm -hmm. Nice. All right. Um, now let me do just a couple of questions about your talks, in particular. So let's do Samuel uh, first. Um, in, in, in you know, just to clarify things about your talk, are we assuming that Discord or any other OAuth provider is going to be edge distributed itself? Does it add latency if they're centralized? Yeah. Um, so we're not, we're, we're signing up with Discord, that we're just using that as the kind of initial authentication thing, then we're getting the data from Discord, then we're putting it in a durable, durable object, and kind of any subsequent request isn't going to Discord at all, it's just going to the durable object. Um, so there's no kind of added latency from Discord. Nice, and then another clarification, we kind of touched on it already, but let's get this answered as well. Um, you know, how quickly do durable objects get synced between edge locations? And I think the answer was they they don't. don't. They don't. Yeah, yeah exactly. They, they, there's no syncing. It's one object in the world for an ID on the planet. That, given an ID, there's just one. So good. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Nice. All right. A uh, couple for Sunil then. Um, how is Particate better than Firestore real time DB? Is Firestore the Google Fire, one? Yeah, the Firebase one. Uh, the guy who makes Particate is more handsome, I guess. <laughs> Uh, what I like about, oh, no, okay, no, uh, the correct answer for it is it's a novel new primitive uh, and I'm working very hard to make the developer experience around it like really good, that you can actually write your own code that runs on these machines. Firestore is just the database interface to these things, if I understand correctly. Uh, the, whole, the whole deal with Particuit is that uh, it chooses an abstraction layer that's high enough that you don't worry about operational cost and complexity but low enough that you can write your own code and choose your own trade-offs while building these systems. Developers want to develop sometimes. They want to write code that uh, runs these things. We'll have an open source version of Firestore running on PartyKit in no time. Yeah, I mean, the, the writing app that, that we worked on, um, you know, we ended up using PartyKit because, you know, while they, you know, we were using CRDTs, YJS, and they are, you know, CRDTs as a service. You could use live blocks, for example. Um, but because we had specific requirements for code that we needed to run on our server in order to like synchronize some things between systems and whatever, just being able to deploy that into the same worker that actually like then handles synchronization is just so, so much better pattern than in Firestore or whatever where you need to do all of this on client side or some kind of like webhook functions. Um, so it just uh, worked out really so, well for us. Sorry, can I also add something there? Yeah. Um, with Firestore as well, you're locked into like the entire Firebase ecosystem for like authentication for everything else because it's just the data layer. But with Particuit, you can you know run everything. That's right. yourself. Hey, thanks, man. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, will Particuit support a non-Cloudflare deployment platform? Uh, will it abstract over the? Great question. Platform? Definitely on the roadmap because the runtime is open source, etc. Uh, if you want to sponsor this work, I have a six-digit, seven-digit number in my mind. If you want to sponsor <laughs> me to do it. But it is on the roadmap. Uh, it's not just a question of like open source, uh, hey, like it's, uh, there are uh, regulatory reasons why you might want to run this on your own hardware. Like uh, I want uh, the bank I used to work at to use this, but they will never use a third party provider. They have their own infrastructure. Uh, but it's a lot harder to do right now because it also means shipping the routing layer, which, well, Cloudflare is never going to open source that bit. But they have the runtime, so we can actually build something that does it on that. They might suffer a little bit for latency, but the plan is very much, yes, you should be able to take a Docker container, deploy it onto your hardware, and do it. But the question of when we'll do it, uh, I, I, I don't know, man. Like, I just, <laughs> I just opened it to everyone right now. I have a long list of features. Um, speaking of the future, you mentioned scaling to larger number of connected users. Um, what strategies are you considering for that? Uh, there are two specific ones. One is automatic sharding, where you will say for a given ID, open up a room, but we might open up 10 underneath it. So suddenly, instead of having 40 people, you can have 400, and these will talk to each other. The other is Cloudflare is also working on tech called hibernation, where WebSockets that aren't sending messages can go to sleep while the object itself so for the right use cases, you can imagine that you can do a lot more users in a single object itself. Uh, yeah, those, those are, I think, are the two big ones. Uh, and yeah, like that, th those are the big ones, I think. Like, it's, like, again, a question of like, trade-offs. For the right trade-off, how do you build these systems? But I think this is a much better foundation to start from than implementing it all in user land. You want it to be an infrastructure level concern. Yeah, Samuel, how does that sound? Do, is that a good plan? Yeah, sounds yeah. good. Yeah. yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the right. sharding that's going to split up a lot of durable objects. So there you go. Pricing would be great for us. I but, know. You know. All right, uh, I've been saving our our most upvoted question for the last. Um, this is a commentary on your um, on your talk title. Everything's better with friends. But I'm going to make this into a serious question, and I'm going to ask this of both of you. Um, what if I don't have friends? Uh, do you not want friends, or is it hard to make friends? I mean, as an adult, it is the hardest thing to do. I think there I is that. a sort of like a undercurrent of sadness in this question. I don't think this person is like happy. Is like, hey, what if I just prefer to be alone? I think there is a sort of. A right, so the first thing you do is come and hang with me today at the after party. There, you got one new friend. Uh, there are going to be robot friends in the future, and I don't know how I feel about that. Uh, and uh, okay, seriously. I felt like a weirdo when I was younger because I didn't find people like myself who cared about the same things. But the internet really connected. Like, it turns out there are, there's always people like you who like the same things as you do, who want to do things with you. You just spend some time on the internet. No matter what your weirdness, your quirk, uh, how 
what you like. Uh, you, you don't really have to change yourself too much for other people. You will find them on the internet. A big, the reason that the tagline for the product, the company, the talk is everything is better with friends is that friends have actually made my life better. Uh, like I said, started from a, a, like a small town in India, did really badly in college, but making friends in the open source community, making friends at every job that I did, making friends at every conference that I go to, uh, that has given me like so much joy and success in my life. So what if you don't have friends? Make friends, we're right here. Like everyone's nice. Most of us are nice. <laughs> Samuel, anything to add to that profound? Yeah, statement? I mean, you're around 200 people who are all at a you know, web development conference. Speak to anyone. Anyone will, will, yeah, could be a new friend. Yeah, and uh, there's, there's a little known secret. Um, they don't tell you this when you come to a uh, conference, but you don't actually have to talk about only JavaScript. Um, you know, we are like-minded people in the sense that we have the same profession and, you know, like same interest and we probably think alike because we are, you know, this particular cut of people. Uh, but one thing that I always find so gratifying coming to conferences like this one um, is how you, when you start talking to people and ask them about, you know, their lives and, you know, what else do, do they do is that you find the most smart, fascinating, interesting, lovely, kind people. So maybe that's a little note for the after party and for the next break, which we'll go on to now. Um, ask a person not what framework you use, but uh, what are their hopes and dreams. Hey, All right. Thanks, man. All right. Yeah. Thank hey, you. It was nice. Thanks.